Battle of Iwo Jima. The 36 days of eating dirt. I went in on the second wave, right at the foot of Mount Suribachi, and it was just like a turkey shooting gallery. I spent 36 days uh, on Iwo Jima, and fortunate enough to come out with uh, some shrapnel on my back and so forth, but. One photographer said, if you were on an Iwo Jima and didn't get wounded or killed, it's like the, the odds are about the same as if you were in your shower dancing around between drops, not getting wet. My first impression was that I'd never get off the island alive. But we, we survived. I don't know how, but we did. I looked off the deck and there was this little rotten looking little island with a small volcano at one end and not much else at the other end. They let the gates down and oh God, I thought I'll never see home again. Iwo Jima was a black cinder. It was a, a nasty looking place and it didn't get any better all the time that we were there. You smelled a combination of diesel fuel from those tanks and boats and ships down on the shore. And with gunpowder, just so thick you could cut it. Iwo Jima means sulfur island. And I don't know of anybody that uh, can't still smell that, you know, the sulfur and the gunpowder. As you came ashore, you realized there's something very different here. Just like you're in quicksand. Your feet would bog up to it nearly to your ankles every step. If you tried to dig a foxhole, it would cave right in on you. I think it was uh, the making of a man for me. Made me a man in the Marine Corps. I was just a kid when I went in and I came out a man. Saying that once a Marine, all we a Marine is definitely true. You're not a former Marine, you're not an ex-Marine. You're a Marine veteran. You're the guy who does his job. And, and he takes care of his fellow Marines. The Marine always looks after the next guy, and they never leave one behind. We're like one big, close-knit family. We take care of each other. We help each other. Uh, we're a, a special group of men. The one word probably you could express is pride. We may, we were just like anybody else, but we thought we were better. <laughs> I enjoyed being in, in an organization that, that you knew what to do and when to do it and how to do it, and you did it. My uh, oldest brother was in the Army, World War II, and my other brother was in the Marine Corps, and I was gonna go to the, to the Navy, so Mom would have one in each branch. My brother from the Marines come home after Pearl Harbor and kept telling me I was too scrawny, the Marine Corps wouldn't look at me. So it made me so mad that I had to join the Marine Corps. And I told him, I said, next time I see you, I'm gonna be wearing that same uniform. He said, no, you're too scrawny. Next time I saw him was on Iwo Jima. And we both got home safe. I uh, saw some pictures in Life magazine right about that same time of the Marines landing at Tulagi at Guadalcanal. And uh, I thought, that's where I want to go as the Marine Corps. I had three brothers in the Navy, and I wanted to be a little different than them, so I thought, I'll just join the Marine Corps. Everybody was patriotic. The country was attacked. You could hardly wait to share the, the uh, duties of, of a citizen. At that age, you're very adventurous. You have that ticket out of you, too. <laughs> I was 17. I was in my last year of high school. And I knew when I turned 18, they were going to draft me. And I didn't want to go in the Army. I wanted to be a Marine. So I uh, 
skipped school one day and went down to a recruiting office and enlisted. I joined the Colorado National Guard in Boulder, Colorado when I was 15 years old. At the time, I was uh, six foot three and weighed 185 pounds. Captain Rogers M. Crosby was uh, the commanding officer of F Company in Boulder, and he was about uh, stretching at five feet tall. I walked in and I said, Captain, how old do you have to be to join this outfit? And he looked up at me and he said, young man, you're old enough. Come in here and sign. Uh, everybody in my uh, high school was going in, you know. Most of them was going Navy. A couple of them went to uh, Marines. And of course, one of your friends went Why well, you wanted to go too. We knew we were going to be drafted, so we got together and decided we wanted to join the Marine Corps. So we did. So I went down to the local draft board office and talked with an old chap down there, and, and my first desire was to get into the Navy, get into their pilot's training, and fly airplanes. So uh, I told him, I asked him what the possibility of doing that was, and he said, sorry, son, that's all full up right now. And so that was just like he took a pin and punched it into my balloon. I said, well, can a guy get in the Marine Corps? Oh, yes, they need you. Put me down. When war broke out, we all rushed down to get into something, and I tried Navy aviation first, and I'm slightly red-green colorblind, so they told me to try something else. So then I, same thing happened with the Army, same thing happened everywhere I went until uh, I got to the Marine Corps and they put their fingers on my face and said, you're warm, sign here. <laughs> I wasn't too much uh, good at, at uh, this student bit because I was anxious to go to war. War had broken out and and uh, so at the end of the year, uh, Uncle Sam and the Marine Corps called me, and I went to, to uh, uh, San Diego for boot camp. We spent one month on the rifle range, and that's all we did. Every day, we'd get out and target practice. And, of course, that's where, among other weapons, I fired the flamethrower. And since I knew how to pound a typewriter, they put me in an office. We landed at every beach in California, I think, and several times, and, and then over in Hawaii did likewise, and then we trained out there. I was an artillery forward observer, so I spent a lot of time out in that desert-like country of Hawaii out there and amongst the uh, lava flows. I was sent to uh, Texas A&M for training to learn International Morse code and become a radio operator. And that was a five month study. I went three, 12 weeks to radio school in, at the base of San Diego. And then thought I was going to radio school, but uh, they said, no, you're going to stay here. You're going to be a drill instructor. I spent 14 months in San Diego making Marines out of, of raw material. I loved it. The only difficulties we had in that period were that the horses knew the commands and we didn't. So the old lieutenant colonel left over from China days was running those things and he'd get us trotting around the, the uh, field and when he got us up to a good speed, he'd say, rup ho, and the horses would make a quick left turn, and we would go over the front of the horse and onto the ground, in which case he would come riding up and say, God damn it, Lieutenant, who gave you permission to dismount? <laughs> you had to be able to recognize just a one thirty-second glimpse of something that was on the screen, uh, identify it correctly. All, of the, all the planes and tanks and everything else for U.S., our allies, and the bad guys. From there, I went to Camp Pendleton. 
which is up near Oceanside, and was uh, assigned to the 20th Engineer Regiment, which was part of the 4th Marine Division, which was being formed at that time. And again, I was given an office job because of my skill with a typewriter. So it turned out that nobody knew any celestial navigation. Well, I'd had a course in, in, at Dartmouth in celestial nav navigation, and our executive officer was an Annapolis graduate. So between the two of us and a bosun on the ship who could take reliable sights, we managed to maneuver that thing so that it landed right in on the Willy Willy Harbor on the island of Kauai. We had done a lot of maneuvering and learning how to climb off of rope ladders and uh, go ashore and all the fake bombing and noise making and all that. But uh, I tell you, when you see that first guy go down, the uh, you, uh, you, you mature in a hurry. That, that was an eye opener. Particularly when he goes down, you can't help him. You gotta keep moving. We saw a picture in the Honolulu paper of the bombers bombing Iwo Jima. I'd never heard of Iwo Jima before. I didn't even know it existed. And we thought, hey, that looks just kind of like the map we, we've been training with. So I wonder if that's where we're going. We didn't know where we was going for a couple of days. And then they brought uh, diagrams out and a big mock-up of the island, you know, and we started training about where we was landed and what to do. We was two days out, and then they told us where we were going. Well, of course, nobody knew. I never heard of you, Jim, and no, I'm, I doubt if any of the rest of them did. They don't tell the lower ranks where we're going, but uh, the minute we talk, uh, we knew we were getting ready to land because they gave us steak and eggs one morning. We had turkey and dressing and pumpkin pie and the whole shebang that you'd have normally on the holidays. The first night, uh, there was an air attack by the Japanese right at dusk. And there was bullets going everywhere and Japanese kamikaze pilots flying in trying to hit our ships. A fighter, Navy fighter plane, comes spiraling down. I heard it sputter, and I looked up, and there it came spiraling down. And uh, it just dawned on me, this is for real. These guys are out to kill us. And they said, well, you're only going to be there about three days because the island was only like seven square miles. And I think somebody miscalculated the amount of Japs that were on that island over 22,000 and of course they were all underground. And they explained to us that it was probably going to be rougher than we thought it was because these guys were all dug in they really didn't know what we were encountering. Just before we landed our lieutenant told us that uh, one out of three of you guys won't come back. We were there overnight and the next morning I got up and went up on deck and I looked out and I thought every ship in the Navy was there. We woke up one morning and there was Iwo Jima. Looked like nothing but smoke. It was being bombed by the uh, Navy, the battleships, cruisers. 72 hours of constant uh, shelling, but it wasn't enough and they thought we could take Evo in about a week. That's what the big brass told us. It was just a little after daylight when it got started. Of course, standing there aboard ship, watching all this going on, oh God, they, they just, I thought to myself, we won't have to go in there. They're gonna sink the island. To hear the shelling all those battleships is just a solid roar. It's not a boom, boom, it's a solid roar. And uh, when a battleship goes off, the whole side of that thing is, is it just looked like the whole thing's on fire. The Navy was pounding them with them 16 inches and everything. Right up to the last minute, the Navy was bombarding the shoreline to soften it up for us. At 
at about five minutes till nine, the battleships quit shelling that beach and that island. Then the dive bombers came in and started dive bombing the beach, and fighters started to bombing the beach. And that went on up until nine o'clock, and at nine o'clock, everything went dead again, just absolutely quiet. You could hear a pin drop, and that first wave hit the beach, and we were right behind them. The main, one of the main objects was to uh, secure the airstrip so our bombers could land, have some place to land when they come back from uh, bombing Japan. It lasted, depending on who's counting, 35 or 36 days. To this day, it, I'm awed by the, by the smallness, the size of the island, but what a horrible, terrible task it was to take it. We had to go in, in the, on the beach, and then there was an incline that we had to go up to get up on the terrace, as they called it. Well, they waited until the guys were up on the terrace, and then they opened up. One of the reasons our casualties became so high was because the first wave went in and got a little way up and didn't come under fire. So they stopped and kind of regrouped and waited. Next wave came, same thing. And that continued until there were some 800 Marines lined up down there waiting for something to happen. And when it did, all hell broke loose. The Japs cut loose with everything they had. And the ramp went down and we took off and ran out there till we got to a little bit of dry sand or beach as ash is what it was, just black ash. And we were laying there and you're trying to shrink up because there was shells popping all around you and artillery and mortars and right above you, you see the tracer bullets coming by. I wasn't pounding a typewriter aboard the troop ship because I was assigned to various teams as we went ashore, the, the uh, bomb disposal group, uh, the demolition team. And then after that, 